get started. Um, it's 1.55 on the dot. Uh, welcome, everyone. Hope you all had an enjoyable lunch. Uh, this panel is Energy, Power, Nature, Hegemony, and Counter-Hegemony. Um, my name is John Wing. I'm the presider. I'll just kind of uh, keep tabs on time and run the questions at the end. Uh, because there are three speakers in this panel, each speaker will get about 20 minutes. Um, and then we'll kind of uh, gather questions at the end. Um, so our first presenter is uh, Siobhan Angus from York University. Uh, title is Picturing Cheap Natures, Extractive Frontiers, and Wilderness. Uh, thank you to everyone for coming. Uh, I'm an art historian, so today I'll be talking about photography and representation. The imaginary has emerged as an important area of inquiry in the discourse surrounding climate change. Questions that probe how the natural world has been culturally imagined and the tangible ramifications of these imaginings point to the importance of representation in both the historical development and contemporary understanding of climate change. Today, I will argue that visual culture does not simply represent or reflect political realities, uh, but rather is a form of world making. The aesthetic reflects how we imagine or understand the world, transforming ideas into forms of representation. Visual cult culture theorist Nicholas Mirzoff describes visuality as a set of mechanisms that order the world and by doing so, naturalizes underlying power structures. Through an assemblage of classifying, separating, and aestheticizing, visual culture mediates the relationship between people and authority, defining who has the right to the real. This process is capital's way of picturing and in turn ordering the world. I'm interested in the role vision and representation play in constructing ideas of nature and society. Essentially, how does visual culture mediate a relationship to the natural world? If capitalism is a way of organizing nature, then it requires attendant forms of seeing. As a case study, I will be looking at landscape photography in early 20th century Canada, analyzing how nature was imagined at the turn of the century and the political implications of these imaginings. I suggest that landscape as a way of seeing the world naturalizes a binary between humans and nature, presenting nature as something external that can be exploited, controlled, put to work, or protected. As Jason W. Moore has observed, dualisms are deeply connected to capitalist development, as capitalism severs symbolically and then acts accordingly. So how are the ways in which we see the world practically bound up with these dualisms? What forms of vision have accompanied successive waves of capitalist expansion? In particular, I'm interested in why, as Ontario began to industrialize, wilderness as a mythology became central to the cultural imaginary. I argue that wilderness landscape photography highlighted raw natural resources, or not yet commodified natures, training Canadians to associate abundance and national destiny with the resource-rich North. At the same time, it reassured Canadians that a more spiritual connection to the world would not be damaged by successive waves of development. The concept of landscape emerged in the 15th and 16th centuries, rooted in Renaissance linear perspective and mercantile capitalism. Naturalistic landscape painting began in Holland at a moment of rapid economic change. It quickly became the most collective genre. Within Europe, vistas of local scenery asserted national pride, while images of foreign sites celebrated overseas commerce and imperial expansion. Artists in the Americas took these forms that emerged from Europe and reinterpreted them to suit different geographies and different political goals. As a genre, landscape is deeply entwined with notions of property, ideologically rooted in the perspective of royalty and the landed elite. As Raymond Williams observed, a working country is hardly ever a landscape, as landscape inherently implies both distance and contemplation. 
typically, as a result, scenes reflect individually owned property rather than any labor on the land. As Jonathan Crary has observed, problems of vision are inseparable from the operation of social power. So if this is the case, then there's two questions that become important in understanding the political function of landscape. First, how is landscape as a genre tied to emerging capitalism? And secondly, how does perspective mediate a relationship to the natural world? Visual culture, th culture theorist W.J.T. Mitchell has argued that landscape is an instrument of cultural power, which portrays an artificial scene that is the result of specific power relations as historic, as ahistorical and inevitable. The dualism of nature and society is enhanced by perspective, which separates the viewer from the scene. It's important to note that perspective is not an accurate reflection of how the eye sees. Uh, as Abigail Solomon Godot observes, natural vision has no vanishing point. Rather, uh, vision is binocular, unbounded, in constant motion, and marked by a loss of clarity in the periphery. In contrast, photographs follow the Renaissance construction of perspective, which converge the eye at a single vanishing point. So perspectively, landscape photography positions the viewer outside the frame, making nature something distant that's observed. So in summation, there's nothing natural about landscape, but rather it's a particular construction of vision tied to very specific political and social realities. Landscape represents both proprietary pride and potential in land and land ownership, but it also addresses some of the anxieties surrounding social transformations, rooting identity in an ancient and unchanging land. Different forms of landscape also assert national distinctiveness. In 1900, Canada had a population of less than six million people spread over millions of kilometers. Depopulated images of wilderness quickly became the dominant form of depicting the natural world. This led to a national identity art historian John O'Brien has described as wilder-centric, emphasizing Canadian distinctiveness from both the United States and Great Britain. The Canadian Shield became one of the most documented and iconically Canadian landscapes in the 1920s, tied to the landscape painting of the Group of Seven, whose sparse, depopulated landscape formed the basis for a pan-Canadian identity rooted in wilderness. The region began to be painted precisely because of the economic development of resources which opened up the region for both tourism and settlement. Landscape has further and more insidious consequences in the context of settler colonialism. The wilderness aesthetic in Canada represents the land that was the territory of indigenous nations as a terra nullius, creating a visual justification for white settlement and the extraction of resources. In images where indigenous people do appear, uh, they are often a part of the landscape, conflating indigeneity with the earth. It's important to note that indigenous groups in the Americas have no tradition of landscape in the form that emerged from Europe. Art historian Ruth Phillips has observed that landscape is incompatible with indigenous ways of seeing the land, for indigenous traditions understand the natural world as a site of mediation. Defined, my defined by mobility rather than a fixed vantage point. Here we see something more akin to web of life rather than the dualism at the root of Western images. These two divergent ways of seeing the world also reflect different understandings of property relations, the nomadic and collective traditions of indigenous land use versus the regimes of private property imposed with colonization. So if landscape is a construction, it's one that has deeply shaped our contemporary understanding of the natural world. My dissertation research focuses on the Canadian Shield, a Precambrian rock formation that contains some of Canada's richest mineral bodies. I'm interested in the site because the region is one of the most visually documented in Canada, though the industrialization is almost always left out of the frame. 
In particular, I'm interested in a silver mining community called Cobalt, uh, which was the site of Ontario's first mining boom in the early 20th century. Cobalt had unique geological foundations with very rich but also very shallow silver deposits which sat on the surface. The high ecological surplus of the community, uh, enhanced by whitewater rivers and pine forests that surrounded it, produced incredible wealth for very low cost, though the lifespan of the camp was less than 20 years. In the first five to seven years of the camp, only high-grade surface ore was extracted, and approximately 70% of the gross value of ore was profit. By harnessing the superabundant natural resources of the region, Cobalt formed a frontier that would provide capital to fund the later development of the region. However, because the veins were so shallow, there was little interest in any long-term development or planning. <coughs> the chaotic development based on the easy extraction of minerals reveals a particular moment in time, a frontier that relied on the appropriation of natural labor to maximize profits. The Canadian Shield is interesting because it's defined by two seemingly incompatible narratives. Famed for both pristine wilderness and the promise of a northern frontier to fuel development. However, at the turn of the century, these two gazes would not necessarily have been understood as incompatible. In the decades following Confederation, cultural creation and economic development played significant roles in a conception of nationhood rooted in geographic exceptionalism finding national destiny in raw natural resources. These two seemingly contrary myths both root Canadianness in resources and isolated northern expanses. So while these two ways of imagining nature initially seem at odds, in Canada, wilderness and capitalist modernity are fundamentally linked. This photo is a good summation of the intersection between the instrumental and the aesthetic. The choppy, glistening waters cascading from the waterfall, the smooth rock face, and the seemingly endless forest root the image firmly in the aesthetic of wilderness. The caption describes, bluffs of rocks covered with birch and poplar and an occasional evergreen, the lonely trunk of a pine or other large tree, the waterfall awaiting to be harnessed to provide electric power for the necessities of our advancing timing, and here also the steam railway, the greatest factor, west, the lakes, and rivers, for the opening and development of this great area. So this article opens up a seeming tension. On one hand, it reveres the beauty of the wilderness, but on the other, and perhaps more strongly, it emphasizes the utility of the resources in the region, celebrating the encroachment of technology. Referencing the mythical city of gold, the article points to the continued obsession with finding natural resources so abundant that healthy profits could be made while keeping human labor inputs to a minimum, in essence, harnessing natural or non-human labor as opposed to human labor. The caption directs the viewer to read this image in an instrumental way, to envision the prospects of our country in terms of silver and gold. So to return to this question of the construction of the observer, the individual trained to see the natural world in a specific way, we can conclude that in the early 20th century, the aesthetic appreciation of wilderness and its exploitation in capitalist development were understood as twin pillars of national destiny. Historian Donald Worcester has observed, quote, Canadians have liked to describe themselves as gathering staples from a vast country while becoming spiritually part of what they exploit. A nation pursuing capitalistic gain with great fervor all the while remaining faithful to an ancient cultural heritage." End quote. Vincent Massey, a Canadian diplomat and influential patron of the arts, who would go on to found the Canada Council for the Arts, summed up the mood of the time when he celebrated the rise of wilderness landscape painting, saying, quote, this treasure laden wilderness will inform our literature and art with a spirit of its own. Commerce and art are becoming allies. Art played an important role in celebrating the great treasure hunt conducted from the sky, its railways nosing their way through forests to northern oceans, the harness which is being thrown on rapid and waterfall, end quote. 
By casting nature as passive and not agentive, the appropriated labor nature performs in the service of capital and its centrality in facilitating industrial development is obscured in favor of an emphasis on human ingenuity and technological innovation. Photography played an important and very specific role in directing this process of exploration and exploitation. Historian Kevin Coleman has observed that two temporalities exist in photographs, the here already and the yet to come. Wilderness photography documented the cheap natures on the Canadian shield, highlighting the superabundance of resources. But at the same time, they also allowed viewers to envision new futures where commerce and art would come together in a nation building project. In this context, wilderness photography connotes that nature provides an endless storehouse of natural resources to fuel economic growth. As art historian Marilyn McKay has observed, images of vast empty wilderness encouraged English Canadian businessmen to imagine the natural world as just waiting for the right businessmen to find them and harness them. The nomadic hero, embodied in both the artist and the capitalist, could then document the process of having dominion or control over the earth. In the early 20th century, there was a largely unquestioned perspective that photographs were evidence of an objective prior reality due to the mechanical nature of photographic production. Photographs were enlisted as a tool to convince, to convince potential investors that the tales of rivers of silver running through rock formations were not the realm of myth. Cobalt was plagued by stock fraud and overcapitalization, and many people were wary of the tales of incredible wealth that came from the community and speculators. In this context, the photographer then played a crucial role as the validator of this new mineral frontier. Though in this context, photographs were often very unreliable witnesses. Photographs emphasize the incredible potential and resources. Some show people literally pointing to the minerals in the rock, while others cast an admiring gaze on the rich bags of silver ore waiting to be shipped south. Others fall more neatly into the tradition of wilderness photography, though rather than a contemplative wilderness tradition, uh, here we see nature's potential as a labor force highlighted. Massey's description of the harness which is being thrown on rapid and waterfall is embodied here, linking art and utility in an evocation of the sublime. So the mythology of wilderness obscured certain histories and experiences in favor of an idealized, ahistorical, and abundant nature. This also hid the social and environmental costs of rapid industrialization. Vision and representation play a significant role in naturalizing this binary division between humans and nature, artificially separating human activity from the natural world. The visual conventions of landscape photography help locate cheap natures, identifying nature as a productive and also abundant force. Nature rendered passive through the distant and contemplative gaze of a camera could be dominated by technology, capitalist production, and human labor. This narrative of nature appreciation has been complicated by a growing awareness of historical realities, calling into question some of the truth claims of the dominant forms of visuality that sustain capital. Mirzoff notes that this ordering of reality is never fully hegemonic. Instead, he points to what he terms counter visuality, a process of picturing the self or collective that resists incorporation into the commodification of vision by both the state and capital. In essence, imagining new forms of world making. Imagination has an important role to play in conceptualizing a way or ways forward in moments of crisis. A key question becomes, how do we imagine ecology without nature? If the visual language of landscape naturalizes this binary between society and people, or sorry, between nature and society, can an ecological imagination enable new ways of seeing? How can we move beyond the ideas of the natural to accept responsibility for synthetic, damaged, or marginal landscapes? The visual can help us meet the ecological challenges of the present, but it requires moving beyond dualisms, 
a methodological shift from the scopic regime of vision and contemplation to an understanding of landscape as historically produced by both the so-called natural and so-called artificial aspects of our world is critical for a more politically engaged visual culture. By understanding how the visual is politicized and the political is visualized, a deeper awareness of how this process supports and sustains systems of power can point to new possibilities of awareness and resistance. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Shalai. <coughs> Our next presenter, um, David Ravensbergen from York University, will be presenting on governing abstract social nature, the case of energy. I'll just give you a chance to sure. set up. Is the uh, oh yeah, there it is. Okay. So hi everyone. Um, good to be here. Uh, it's a bit unfortunate that I'm following an art historian because my uh, somewhat feeble attempt at making a PowerPoint <laughs> is going to be uh, shown in sharp relief. Uh, but anyway, I hope you'll bear with me. Um, so right now I'm at kind of this moment in my PhD where I'm kind of uh, waffling between a number of different possibilities for my dissertation, and this is one of them, so I'm just going to see what you think. Um, so the story that I'm looking at is the development of energy as an instance of abstract social nature. It begins with the development of energy as a form of equivalence in thermodynamics, which enables the 